Well, good evening. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. I appreciate you joining us again. I hope uh, hope the the messages this morning, uh, myself and Tim, I hope it was a help to you. Uh, I hope the uh, Sunday school for our children uh, on the Zoom meeting, I hope that was a help for them as well. And we're trying to do all we can, uh, you know, to help each one of you uh, spiritually to grow uh, during this time that uh, we voluntarily had chosen, and for once, thank the Lord, the government didn't tell us uh, what to do, uh, closing our doors, but uh, we did feel that it was the uh, safest thing right now, just the best thing to do. And, and uh, it was, you know, it was very hard making that decision. It's, it's very tough. It's not easy. I know myself and the deacons, we don't take lightly. I made mention last week about that, you know, to cancel any service. And right after it happened, I mean... Man, I tell you, I, I just, I, I felt terrible. You know, I, I was going, Lord, did I do the right thing? But then it wasn't long after that of of hearing what was going on in the area, other churches having, uh, having to close their doors because several people within the church getting COVID and passing it to one another. And, and once again, I, also, you know, you got to remember there's still, there's flu out there, there's pneumonia out there. There's still other illnesses out there, but all they talk about is COVID. But anyhow, um, I, I felt much better once I seen, you know, just how everything was going on. And I, and I know several other churches hasn't, and that's fine. I just felt it was the best to do for us. And once again, it's, it's not easy uh, decision, but I did feel it was the best thing to do for us. And so I thank the Lord, though, we're, we're able to at least do the live stream and continue to spiritually uh, feed you, but we're, it's definitely not like being together, being assembled together. And so, thank the Lord, it, it's not uh, uh, hadn't been very long. And Lord's willing, as of next Sunday morning, we will start January the third, right into the new year. We'll start again, um, meeting again in person. And Lord's willing, um, you know, this illness, this pandemic. Uh, you know, and all this flu and, and viruses going around, hopefully we'll, you know, we'll start trying to going away and won't cause us to have to uh, be asked to shut down again, you know, uh, from the government. So anyhow, we, we uh, thank the Lord that we're able to be together and looking forward to that. Uh, well, I hope you have your Bibles with you this evening or, or once again, if you have an electronic device that you use for your, uh, with a Bible app or something on there, so if you would, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2. I want to read a couple verses here, and then we're going to turn the page to Acts, chapter 4, which is uh, really the, where I get the title of the message this evening. Uh, the title of the message is, They Had Been With Jesus. They Had Been With Jesus. Acts, chapter 2, I want to look at verse uh, 41 and 42, and then we're going to skip over to Acts, chapter 4, and read verse 13. So Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42. Uh, this here, as I read, keep in mind, uh, this, I, I, what I want us to kind of look at is the, uh, the building, the setting up of the New Testament church, the first New Testament church. Um, as folks were being saved, uh, churches were being planted, uh, people were being discipled, and souls being saved, and baptized, and growing in the Lord. Uh, you know, I want us to kind of look at that. Uh, this has not changed. I mean, we, we can go back to the New Testament church, and we should, and look at the New Testament church and how it was built. Uh, God's way of growing a church has not changed from now. Uh, it's, it's still the same. And so maybe things, times has changed, technology has changed, but God's way, uh, just like we have preached on, of course, the Great Commission, uh, that, too, has not changed uh, at all how we're supposed to still be doing it today, right according with God's word uh, when he gave it to us back then. But in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42, it says here, Then they, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Now, received his word, we know from Scripture they had received the word, they had believed and trusted in Christ as Savior received his word, were baptized. In the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. 
And then in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says here, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you at this time. We once again want to thank you for your word. And Lord, as we read and study many times, Father, I know for me it causes me to realize, Lord, how much I do fail you. And Lord, in spending time in study as I should, Lord, and praying as I should. And Father, I pray that, Lord, you would just continue to speak to our hearts, Lord, and Lord, help us, Lord, just continue to have a faithful relationship with you. Help us walk with you as we should. Uh, help us witness as we should, pray and study. Uh, Father, I pray and ask you that if there's anyone listening to this message that does not know you as Savior, I do pray that, Lord, that they'd be saved at this very day, this very moment, receive and accept Jesus Christ into their hearts. And we'll praise you and thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, as we're getting ready to <clears throat> enter here into 2021, um, I don't think there's too many people that uh, want to hang around 2020 too much longer. And, and, I, and, and really, not, I'm not trying to, to sound, um, uh, paint a, a dismal portrait or picture here, uh, but we, we don't know what next year holds either. Um, we don't know what we're going to be faced with in, in the world, in our nation, in our country. But we know this. I, I have no idea what's up for next year except what's in that book right there. I know exactly that that will not change. I know exactly what's going to happen uh, according to God, and so we know that. So that should be encouraging for us. It should be, and, and it is encouraging. But as we begin, of course, to get into uh, getting ready to step next, <clears throat> I guess what Friday will be, January the 1st. Is it Friday? Yes, it'll be January the 1st. Uh, 2021. Um, as we always <clears throat> come to this time of year, many people uh, will uh, kind of think back on the last year, uh, you know, about their lives, maybe things that, uh, that happened, uh, things they'd gone through, uh, good things, bad things, uh, trials, victories. And as, you know, as a Christian, as a church, we, we also... Um, I know myself as a pastor, um, I don't always just do this at the beginning of the year. I, I do this constantly through the year. I kind of examine myself, um, how I'm leading as a pastor. Uh, I kind of, I look at our church, uh, what the Lord is using us for. Is there, is there more we, that the Lord wants us to do? Is there a different direction that he wants us to go in the, in the sense of ministries? Um, you know, just, you know, what would God have us to do? And so, when we look at, uh, you know, this past year, we look at this upcoming year, a lot of times we kind of look and we examine ourselves, okay, we're, you know, we're, how far did I come spiritually? Uh, looking at last year, maybe in January and unto the end of this, this month here in December through, for the year, you know, how, looking at your spiritual life, you know, we might ask ourselves, how, you know, how did I, you know, did I grow uh, did I did I stay the same? Did I go backwards? Um, what exactly you know did God accomplish uh, with me and through me? Because we want to make sure that our church um, we want to make sure it moves forward. We want to make sure we stay faithful doing the the things of God as an assembly of believers. And see um, how how spiritual a church is depends on how spiritual the people are. Uh, how faithful the church is depends, once again, how faithful the people are because it is the Christians that make up the church. And once again, whether it's, uh, whether it's 12, uh, you know, assembled together, or 24, whether it's 50, 100, I mean, you go on and on. Um, as we are assembled together, we, we as believers, we make up the church. And and so we have to ask, or ask ourselves, where, where are we spiritually? Um, how, have we, how has the Lord dealt with us spiritually this year? And, and so what's, you know, what's our desire for next year as we enter into next year? 
And the church, of course, cannot be where it should be without the individuals being where they ought to be. So, um, and, and no one can uh, know with, of course, without the Bible. And so when we say that, we need to understand there is no substitute for the Bible. There, there's nothing. There's, there's no type feelings. Uh, there's no experiences. Uh, there's no labors or, or ministries or opinions or, or, or psychology that can substitute for God's word. There's nothing. And, and let me just say to you also, as you listen to this message, is, you know, a lot of times we will hear uh, somebody give a testimony, we'll hear someone's experience in something. But stop looking, you know, don't look at experiences. Um, we learn from the Word of God. Uh, we can't, yes, we can, we can learn from experiences people go through or seeing God work in someone else's life or work in our life. We can learn from that. From that. But sometimes some Christians get so caught up in wanting to have some kind of experience. They hear somebody else tell an experience how maybe they went through some kind of illness or sickness and, you know, how God healed them and, and, and brought them back or someone, you know, how, you know, they lost everything and didn't know what they were going to do. And then God, you know, he, he brought, you know, give them back, you know, and better than what they had and uh, give them the job they were looking for. I mean, all kinds. Of, and we think, Man, you know, let me. You know, what can God? You know, what can God do for me? And the greatest thing we can do for the greatest thing we can do is just be obedient to the Word of God, and and not a lot. But some Christians don't get caught up in trying to live, uh, especially trying to live out someone else's experience or testimony in something. Don't try to live through them. Allow the Lord to work through you and with 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 the life that the Lord gives you. So, uh, none of these mentioned the experiences, labors, ministries. None of them, uh, we mentioned, can accomplish or reach the depth in our lives like God's Word can do. Uh, there, there, there are no substitutes. In fact, if you want to, uh, you don't have to turn with me, I, I, but if you want to, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, 4, verse 12 might be very familiar to some of you, but if not, if you're not there, just listen. The Bible says here, for the Word of God is quick. That word quick there means living. It means living and operative. In other words, uh, God's word is a living, working word. Um, it, it's, the, it's the only living, working book we have on the face of this earth. It's the only one. I mean, this is, this is Christ. Uh, uh, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so he says, for the word of God is quick. It's, it's living. It's, uh, it's operative. It, it, it works. Uh, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, uh, <laughs> listen, there, there's no other book on the face of this earth that can tell you exactly how you are like the Word of God. I mean, we read God's Word and we go, hmm. Sometimes we read it and we say, oh, man, that's, that's me. I mean, the, sometimes people say we use the phrase, you know, stepping on toes, and I know we use that phrase, but really when, when the Word of God really gets to it, it's not, it's not that the Word of God stepping on our toes, it's piercing our heart. Sometimes, buddy, ooh, it hits us direct, and that, there's a direct hit and, and sometimes it, it's tough, but let me tell you something. It's always good. Man, it's, it's good when the Word of God will show us where we have failed because, see, God's trying to let us see that so we can change and we can grow and we can be conformed to Christ, which is much greater. So thank the Lord he won't leave us where we're at. But the Word of God is so powerful that it's able to reach the deepest and, and the most secret inward parts of mankind where nothing else can reach. That's how powerful the Word of God is. Um, listen, that's why you and I, we can never say, you know, well, oh, Lord, that person will never get saved. They'll never hear the Word. Listen, you, the Word of God is able to reach the deepest part of man's being. Another than anything else in the world. 
it's the Word of God that does it. It's able to break through the coldest, darkest, most evil heart. In fact, it's the only thing that can break through the coldest, most darkest, evil heart. It's able to do it because it's living, because it's a, uh, it, it's a, a, a progressive, it's, it's working, uh, as we just seen in, in, the, in the Word of God. It's a, it's a living, working Word. It's powerful. It's, it's living because it's Christ. And it says, and the Word was made flesh. And so it's just amazing how the Word of God, what it can do for us. And once again, this is so important that you and I study the Word of God. Read, study, uh, memorize, hide God's Word in our heart that we might not sin against thee. Uh, so once again, it's, it's very important we do all these things according to the Word of God, and it, it is so powerful. But, but I want us to go back to, to the book of Acts where we were at a while ago. In Acts chapter, uh, chapter 2 here in, in verse... Uh, uh, 41 and 42, once again, of course, you can go and read, the, you can read through the whole chapter if, if you want to and several other chapters. But this passage of Scripture here teaches us um, uh, four parts of worship. You know, Tim was speaking this morning in Sunday school talking about uh, the wise men, the magi uh, that uh, came in worship. And like he said, it says men, so we know there was two or more. It could have been two. It, could have been 20. I, you know, we don't know, but it wasn't. We know it could have been three, but we don't know that because of the three gifts. The thing is, he brought out about worship this morning. I really believe that's something that, um, that we need to, in, in fact, I've been, once again, one of the things I mentioned this morning as a pastor, you're always studying on different subjects. Um, uh, I've been studying also, on, and I, not that I haven't studied it before, but you're always studying to learn more. And I really believe we need to look more at worship. And Tim brought out some good points about worship uh, this morning. And I tell you, this is very, very important. But I want us to look at, in verse 42, it teaches us uh, four parts of worship. Uh, here it says, And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. And, and we see, of course, first of all, it said in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word. So uh, one thing, we need to hear the Word of God. Hearing the Word of God is very important. Um, you, you need to, let me just say this, you need to be very careful who you listen to. Um, some people get, you got to be careful who you get caught up listening to that's preaching or teaching. You want to make sure it's not a false prophet. There's many of them out there today. I mentioned this morning about the, uh, uh, the so-called prosperity preachers, you know, uh, uh, preaching, you know, of, of uh, the Christians, you know, it's, it's the will of God that all believers be rich, and uh, that is not biblical teaching and preaching. That's not correct. It does is not correct from the Word of God at all. And, and but you have to be very careful about the teaching uh, of Christ. You got to be very careful who you listen to. There's some on TV that I've listened to before, and. And, and it's exactly as the Word of God says. All they do is tickle your ears, your ears. In other words, all they're doing is giving you everything that just sounds positive. Uh, so you, you notice I even uh, I even had to go into that mode sometimes of how they speak. You know, oh God just loves you and He wants you to be prosperous and He just wants the best for you and blah. And it's like God wants to do everything for you and you don't have to do nothing for Him. That ain't biblical. Um, once again, um, we could, you know, I don't want to get off on a, on a, another subject here, a rabbit trail, but uh, make sure who you're hearing, they're preaching and teaching Bible truth from the Word of God and not just giving you all this garbage of all time, feel good type messages, just feel good, feel good, feel good. Listen, we, we need the whole counsel of God's Word preached. So, but we see here four parts of worship is hearing the Word of God. Uh, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Uh, they were hearing the word of God, the things that were being taught to them from, of course, the word of God. We also see here, we see here, of course, it says in fellowship. Uh, fellowship. Uh, a lot of times we also see with what, a, a phrase that goes along with fellowship, we will see one accord. Uh, that phrase, one accord, we see mentioned uh, many times. 
Uh, sometimes we see, I know in Nehemiah talks about as one man. Once again, talking about being in one accord as one man as we fellowship together. Um, you know, I, I, this has been years ago. I'll never forget there was a family. Uh, they were looking for a church, and they came and visited our church, and they went and visited another one. And after uh, back and forth, I don't know, two or three months, um, they finally come to me and said, uh, Pastor, just want to let you know, we've we decided it's, uh, to go ahead and go to such and such church. And uh, it wasn't even, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a Baptist denomination, uh, independent Baptist. And they said, that's what they said now, the parents. They had two children. They said, we really don't agree with some of their doctrine, but they really have some good stuff for our kids. You know, and I'm thinking, really, you're going to sell out for the truth, to teach your kids true doctrine? You're going to sell out for entertainment because they have more to offer the kids as far as entertainment goes? Some people might say, you know, listen, I know, and we're, I don't want to get off on, Lord, this subject is, this is a big subject, okay? It could go on for weeks, but, you know, com, you know talking about true worship and, and entertainment. Um, let, you know, people say, well, you know, you, you know, children shouldn't be sitting in the adult service, and, and uh, yes, we, do, we have classes where we try to teach children from a perspective of, at their level that they can understand but I, I do believe, and that's why we've never had a Sunday evening service uh, where we take the children out. I believe there, there, there ought to be, and some might believe there ought to be in every service. And I'm not going to argue with you on that. But I believe children at some point, at least once a week, ought to be in the service with adults to see how to worship, how, they, how we worship, how we praise, how we sing, uh, how we give tithes and offerings and give an offering plate. I think children ought to see this. They, um, and, you know, well, my child won't sit still. I, I mean, they, listen, they will. I know another whole subject here. Believe me, there's ways to make a child sit still. You can make them behave in church. Trust me, we did. You might not, some today might not want to do it like they did back in the day, but I tell you what, it worked. Um, you know, my dad, I mean, all he had to do was just look at us, buddy, and we straighten right up. And, and, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, even if a kid's fidgety, you know, if they give them a coloring book, I mean, you know, even, but they'll even listen. I mean, kids, they, they soak in so much. And, and so, uh, you know, talking about fellowship, about uh, one accord, I don't know how I got on all the way there. But anyhow, I, 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 we went kind of a long ways there. But we're talking about fellowship. We're talking about being in one accord in uh, the doctrine, of course, listening to the Word of God and the doctrine of Christ, being, being in one accord. Uh, they also says the breaking of bread. Uh, that, of course, once again, uh, you know, a lot of times when you see, see fellowship in Scripture, I know we joke about, you know, all the Baptists do is eat, you know. Uh, and I'm not saying you have to all the time, but, there is something to be said about many times in Scripture when you see the assembly coming together. Not always, but uh, a lot of times when they come together, they did have a meal together. I'm not saying they had to have a full meal, but they broke bread together. Uh, they did eat together. And I, I think that's very important. Uh, and then, of course, we see at the end breaking of bread and in prayers. So we see here the, uh, there's, there's four parts of worship here, hearing the word, fellowship, breaking of bread, and of course, prayers. Now, in the beginning of Acts 2, we have the what we call the day of Pentecost. And verses 14 through 36 is Peter's message to the Jews that the Lord had called on Peter, of course, to preach to the Jews. And in, and in verses 36 through 42 is the first phase, we could say. Now, let's go back to verse 42 again. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The, the word doctrine means the act of teaching, learning, knowledge, instructions. In other words, the doctrine of Christ are, are, are the principles of truth. Uh, they received them, they retained them, and they acted on them and they obeyed them. The marks of the true church are the doctrines of Christ. Uh, you have to... Uh, we have to be very careful today, be careful once again of false doctrines. 
the false teachings of Christ, uh, things that are not in the Scripture. There's many religions today that teach a lot of things that's not in the Scriptures. Uh, there's many today that teach, of course, some, some doctrines, some, some of the, the instructions, the knowledge, the teachings of our Lord. Uh, they teach these things. Also, also this too, and I, and I realize I'm, I'm going back to something I said this morning. I say it, I probably said it last week, I say it all the time, is uh, once again, Serving the Lord, having a relationship, is not only just knowing the doctrines, which we have to and should, but it's knowing Christ himself as well. Not just learning the doctrines, but learning Christ. Uh, not just obeying the doctrines, but, but serving the Savior as well. So these things kind of, they go together. We, the doctrines help us learn and teach us of the relationship that we ought to be having, the life that we ought to be living, all these things that we ought to be learning. It says that they continued. Uh, the word continued means agree, hold, have charge of, use. So they use. So they continued in these things. And uh, In other words, uh, once again, it's, this is something... This is an ongoing process in the life of every Christian. We, we continue in this, and the reason we continue is because you never come to the point of learning all the doctrine. You never get there. So there's always more to learn. Uh, this is also uh, something that is a big responsibility for a, for a pastor and for teachers in the church as well, is to, is to continue to teach, you know, all the... Uh, all the doctrines of Christ uh, to teach, you know, all, all the Scripture uh, that we can learn from it, uh, every bit of it. We need to learn from it. We need to learn it. We need to know it. Yes, I have forgotten a lot. I, I go back now. It's been 20, a little over 24 years now since I've been pastoring, and I go back now and look at a lot of past messages and look at my notes and stuff like that, and I just read through them and uh and I'll run across something that the Lord taught me, you know, that I preached on or taught on. I'm like, oh, man, that, man that's good. Not, not because it's my notes, it's because the Lord taught me. But I'd forgotten it. But we also remember a lot. We might forget a lot, but we also remember a lot. And so, that, so we need to continue this. It's not something you get saved, you get involved in church for a little bit, and then you go about your own business. It's, it's a continuing process until the Lord takes you home or he returns. It also says here that they they continued, they they agree, they they had charge, they used these things, and it says uh, here steadfastly. Uh, the word steadfastly means to be earnest toward, to persevere, to be constantly diligent, adhere closely to. All right, so let's read verse 42 again. And they continued, remember we're talking about in the doctrines, they continue steadfastly, steadfastly to be earnest toward, to persevere, to be constantly diligent, adhere closely to. In other words, it's it, to take it, uh, you know, and I mean this gives a great definition. When I read those definitions, I think of seriousness. In other words, to take it very serious, it's something that, you, you constantly are doing. You, in other words, you, you give it your all. You put your all into it. Um, there are so many Christians that come to church just to be able to check it off their Sunday to-do list. I'm, I'm serious. There's a lot of Christians that do that. Um, and now, I'm, I'm not, I don't know who that is. I'm just saying, though, we know that according to Scripture and the way Christians live today, there's many that just come to church just so they can check it off their to-do list that they did that. Some feel it's okay if they're if they as long as they can check one service off. Listen, we we don't meet. Uh, we have Sunday school on Sunday mornings. We have Sunday morning service and Sunday evening. We don't do this because the Baptists started this years ago or. Or before that even started, you know, some Christians started doing this, and we're just uh, following their tradition. We don't. No, we're we're doing it because we need all the the teaching and preaching we can get. And three times a Sunday is still not enough, but it's good because three times on a Sunday, if you think about it, 
we're not going to get no more of it. And, to, you know, the, the average Christian, they're not going to study or teach or uh, listen to other messages until Wednesday night. And then from Wednesday, then you got Sunday. So you've got, you know, three on Sunday, one on Wednesday. That's four. There's seven days. So that's not even enough to carry one a day. But what I'm trying to say here at Calvary, we don't, we don't do this just by tradition. We, we don't pick a time by tradition. No, it doesn't say we have to have morning worship at 11 o'clock or Sunday school at 945. Nowhere in Scripture it says we have to have an evening service. You, listen, you can meet at 7 in the morning if you want to and, and, and stay to noon, you know, and have, then have a meal together and then go home. I'm, I'm just saying that there's nothing in Scripture. It's, the main point is to continue doing this, to be, to, to, to be serious about it, uh, you know, to, uh, to be earnest toward it and to persevere it uh, of the uh, of coming together. Jude verse 3 says earnestly contend for the faith. Uh, that phrase earnestly contend for the faith carries the meaning stand agonizingly for. In other words, I mean, you know, stand up for it even at times when we physically or, you know, emotionally we personally don't want to, we know we come to the place where we know we need it. And so therefore we follow through. The phrase continue steadfastly when you put them words together means remaining by his side, not leaving or forsaking. So once again, speaking of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to remain by his side, uh, which goes with John chapter 14 that talks about we are to abide in Christ. Look over in John chapter 1, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Acts. You're already in Acts 2. Look at Acts chapter 1. I got talking about John and got... Uh, a little confused there. Look at Acts chapter 1 and look at verse 14. These all continued, there we are again, continued with one accord. There we remember I mentioned that earlier in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Look at Acts chapter 2, where we were at, and look at verse 46, just, uh, just four verses down from where we're at. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So we continue to see this word, of course, breaking of bread. Now, this is, um, this is both practical and there's a practical and spiritual application. First of all, the, the practical application would be uh, that breaking of bread uh, with a family in which we are a, a spiritual family when we're saved. It's a symbol of family unity. When we break bread together, when, when we eat together, um, and we have a meal together, we sit down in, in, in fellowship by, over food. This, this is a showing you, a unity and, and friendship with one another. But what's important is the spiritual part of it. When the Bible says breaking of bread, this is, this is the main point that this scripture is speaking of. Uh, we know according to uh, John chapter, in fact, let's, if you want to turn with me there, John chapter 6, John chapter 6, and let's look and see where the, where the Lord, he calls the word of God bread, John chapter 6, and look at verse 32 and 33, John 6, 32 says, then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God <clears throat> is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world, which we all know, of course, is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> the breaking of bread is, the word of God is called bread, and we see that uh, it was performed, of course, by the master of the house, uh, Christ being the master we see it was performed uh, by him. Uh, this also, we see that he did this, of course, at the Lord's Supper. Was also once again, as and we do that, uh, we do that uh, here at Calvary. The first Sunday of each month, uh, we have communion. Uh, we give, of course, the the bread which represents Christ, and we give uh, the uh, the juice which re represents as a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, the Lord, that's one of uh, one of the uh, ones that the Lord give us here to do, of course, you know, uh, ordinances out of two of them. That's one of them that the Lord give us to do as a church and in remembrance of. We do it, 
in remembrance of uh, for ourselves and also to bring glory and honor to the Lord God. But the Bible says they continuing steadfastly uh, in breaking of bread. But look, look what it also says, breaking of bread and in prayers. So all of this cannot be done properly without prayer. Once again, I know we have put, we've put strong emphasis this year on prayer. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, this coming year, I mean, in other words, we've always put emphasis on prayer, but I, I believe we need more, stronger emphasis on prayer. And that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to do. That's what we did this past year. I felt the Lord leading us to do that. And that's what we want to do this year and, and the next year and the next and on and on. We want to continue to, to show the importance and put emphasis, strong emphasis. We know that faithful living cannot be lived without faithful praying. It's a person that's not faithful in praying, they're not going to be faithful in their living. It's not, it just ain't, it's not going to happen. I, I'm sorry, it's just biblical. Um, so if, if, a, if, if a person, if a Christian, if they're not faithful in their prayers and they're not faithful in the Word of God, they're, they're not going to have a faithful, faithful life to live to be like Christ. We're not saying that you're not going to live like Christ at all uh, and you're not going to obey at all, but it's not going to be what it's supposed to be. Uh, you and I, we are to have a private prayer life. We've taught on that before a prayer closet. Uh, we, we go, of course, individually, and then we have a pu public prayer life. And true revival uh, comes from a love of praying. It doesn't just come from praying. True revival comes from a love of praying, uh, uh, a love of praying that we are fully dependent upon God in. We're fully trusting him in our prayers. And it also mentions, of course, fellowship. Uh, the word fellowship here is, is a verb, not a noun. Uh, the word fellowship, now, for those of you that know, has known me for a long time, you knew I had to look that up. Uh, you knew I didn't know that right off the top of my head, okay? Um, <laughs> I wish I did, but unfortunately I don't. But fellowship uh, here is a verb, not a noun. Uh, the word fellowship means partnership, having things in common, participation, once again, I cannot express enough uh, the importance of being involved in a local ministry and assembly of believers. Every Christian, every child of God, we are commanded. This is not suggested. We are commanded to be part of a local ministry. I, I mean, listen, I, I've heard over the years you hear so many excuses. Um, you know, people say, well, I, I just don't, I don't like organized religion. Neither do I. I don't like it, neither did Christ. And that's why we don't come here for organized religion. We come here for relationship with Jesus Christ. We come here for true Christianity. We come here for true religion, which is Jesus Christ, the pillar and ground of truth, the only true religion. No, we don't, uh, no, we don't follow man's religion either. Uh, we follow the teachings of Christ. We follow Christ himself. And so, uh, you know, people have all kinds of excuses. You know, they say, well, you know, on weekends, I just, you know, on Sundays, I tell you, I just, I just like to go. And when I'm out there, you know, in that, in that boat, when I'm out there on the lake fishing, it's peaceful and quiet. I just, I just feel so close to God. And, and when our, you know, I, I've heard all, the, I've heard all kinds of them. When I'm up in the mountains, when I'm, when I'm up there on Sunday and I'm just kind of hiking through the mountains, man, it's just, a, uh, just peace and quiet, or I'm walking through this park. And listen, you, you can say you feel as close to God as you want to, but God tells us in his word how we know that we are close to him. You might feel that way all you want. The Bible tells us we're to test the spirits. Oh, yeah, there, there, there may be a, uh, the spirit of Satan, uh, the spirit of the Antichrist, allowing you to feel that way. It's, and you know why you feel so peaceful? It's because it's one of them temporal things that just gives you a, a quietness and peacefulness of mind. But the rest of the time, it's not going to do a thing for you. Next time, you know, you have tragedy come into your life. Um, go out there and get on that boat and get out there in the lake. And you just, 
you know, you just lost a child. You just lost a wife to death. Go out there and get on there and see how it makes you feel. You won't find no feelings then. And so, once again, I, that's, uh, you know, something else we need to be careful not to, uh, not to count on is the things of this world, temporalness of this world. But fellowship, it, uh, God wants us to be a part of a local ministry. Well, there's nothing but a bunch of hypocrites there. When I go to church, ain't nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. Be like one preacher, a person came up to him one time and said, you know, pastor, I just, uh, this is why I don't like coming to church. There's, there's just too many hypocrites. And the pastor looked at him and said, well, come on and join. One more ain't going to make no difference. Um, listen, yes, there's, there's folk, yes, there's hypocrites in the church. Yes, there's some that fail the Lord. But listen, it's, it's, it, but we're striving to be like Christ. We're striving to learn not to be hypocritical, um, to, to, to be conformed to the image of Christ. And you, you cannot do this. You can't do this on your own. That's why he's called for the assembly to come together. It takes an assembly together. Uh, you know, it's, it's back like, like here this last couple weeks, we haven't been able to assemble. I say we haven't. We chose not to for the safety of the people. Now, once again, back at the beginning of this COVID, they forced us, I say forced us, we didn't have to. They, they mandated that we not meet, and I think we went, what, three or four weeks that we didn't meet, we did things live stream. You say they forced, they didn't force us to, we, but we chose to, to, to try to go along with it, once again, for the protection of the people. My thing was, is back then it wasn't so much the government as it was, we didn't know much about this virus. And now that we, we know a lot of things we've been told is hadn't been the truth about it, um, we now know a little more about it. But what we did this past two weeks, once again, it's like I made mention, we've done that a couple times in the last 24 years. Man, you get, you know, you get 20, 30, especially 40, 50% of your people in a two-week period that get some kind of flu bug. Hey, it, it, it's best just to say, okay, let's take a couple weeks, a couple services, and let's not meet, you know, everybody can I get healthy again. I, I think the Lord wants us to use good reasoning for that. There's a difference in doing that. And then every time somebody gets a cold, you know, we say, okay, let, you know, no service the rest of this month. You know, uh, old junior here, you know, he's got the sniffles. And no, we're not talking about that. We're, we're talking about people, you know, in the sickness, but, uh, you know, serious things that can happen be real serious uh, in, in their illness. But, you know, it's very important that we assemble together and, and hopefully times like this helps us realize how much we miss it. Listen, we've got some folks um, that hasn't been able, and I'm not going to mention their names because of being live streaming, but our church knows them. We've got a couple right now, a lady that has to be very, very careful. Um, I mean, she's recovering from uh, cancer and, and, you know, and gone through a lot of treatments um, they have to be very. They have to be very careful because, and and you can't blame them for that. And one day they'll be able to be with us again. But there's some folks that that's unable. There's sometimes you're unable to do what what you're used to doing. But the thing is, make sure your heart. Make sure you stay uh, connected. Now that's another thing when we talk about a person not involved. Many times they feel disconnected. Uh, you know. Like I said, a lot of folks, they come up with excuses why they, you know, they don't want to be in a church. Listen, it's very important. And if you're in a church that's just going through the motions, uh, going through the ceremonies, traditions, don't waste your time there. If the truth isn't being preached, you need to get out. You need to go to a place that teaches and preaches the truth. Um, but listen, there's going to be people, whenever you are a part of an assembly, whenever you're part of an assembly of believers, I, I'm just going to tell you right up, a pastor sometime is going to let you down. It's going to happen. Um, you know, uh, others in the church, the deacons, you know, they're going to let you down. Your friend in the church, they're going to let you down. Other members will let you down sometime. Listen, it's going to happen. But the thing is, these things happen, but it shouldn't be to the point that, you know, that we just completely stop assembling with God's people because God commands us to do that. And so we assemble together. And let me ask you, you know, what do you do to help improve that? Uh, you know, to be encouraging about it. Sometimes there's people in the assembly of believers that, are, that they're down, they're discouraged. And there's some there, we need to encourage them. There's other times you'll be down and somebody will have to encourage you. So we, we need to make sure because 
Listen, a person that's not involved, they, they also feel disconnected. Um, you know, from you know, from from church and from a belie- assembly of believers. And I hate to say this, but sometimes a person that's feeling disconnected can be dangerous, because then they get upset, and then they start thinking things that's not really happening. Uh, sometimes people that just pop in and out, they're not very faithful. I'm not saying always, I'm really not. Cause, and I'm not talking about people that can only come certain times. I'm not talking about them either. Uh, you know, some folks, they come and, man, it's all they can do to get here service because of maybe their, their illness or they can't drive at night. Uh, and that, that's, listen, that's between them and the Lord, that's understandable. But I'm talking about people just purposely, they, they, that's in their plan not to be very faithful. They, they can be very dangerous because then they start thinking somebody's talking about them and, and and next thing you know they uh you know they they somebody somebody might even tell them that that somebody said something they mis misheard what was said they said well I heard so and so say this and so they can be very dangerous and so uh, trouble and complaining usually comes sometimes from those that that's not involved but not always uh, please I I'm not going to stick with this just say always because sometimes it can be even from the faithful that can get disgruntled. But the Bible says they continue steadfastly, not only in doctrine, but in their attendance to fellowship with others. You notice that. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Keep in mind now, we're talking about the apostles' doctrine. They had been been with Jesus. They had been taught. And they were teaching what Christ taught them. They weren't teaching their own teachings, but what Christ taught them. Uh, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And so it's, uh, they continue steadfastly in these things, but their attendance to fellowship with others, they were faithful in it. We need to be faithful in that. Uh, Christ was always the center of their fellowship, and we can, you know, you can talk of other subjects, but the, the main focus should be Christ. Uh, Christ should always be the center, you know, among the church and the assembly of believers. Um, we should have, because of Christ and following these things, it should bring us to a place of having a mutual affection for one another, uh, to have a love for one another, love of Christ, to have compassion for each other, uh, to have a, a mutual conversation, which many times is that of Christ being centered. Uh, and once again, to, uh, to sympathize with one another, to converse with one another, and then uh, mainly to pray for one another and pray with one another is so important. So we have to ask ourselves, how much effort do you put in fellowshipping with your brothers and sisters in Christ? How much effort do you put into it? Listen, instead of sitting back and saying, well, they didn't do this for me and uh, they, you know, that person was out sick and they, they sent them a meal and I was out sick and they didn't send me anything. Listen, things are going to, we don't purposely do those things. Things is going to fall through the cracks sometimes. It, it really is. And it's not purposely done. I assure you, if there's a reason or purpose, I will come and tell you. Um, it's, this isn't purposely done. It just, sometimes these things happen. But what, what are you doing? What are you doing for the assembling of the believers? What, what are you offering to the church that, in a form that can be encouraging uh, to uh, uh, to love one another and to provoke, as the Bible says in Hebrews uh, ten twenty uh, four, to provoke one another into love and good works. What are you doing? Well, they're not doing it. Well, let God deal with them. What are you doing to provoke one another into love and good works? Um, you know, we learn through more study that there's more than these four parts of worship. I understand that, but we just uh, I just wanted to mention those those four, but this is the beginning of a foundation, though, uh, of worship. And and let me just say this. These four we see here in this verse is not negotiable. In other words, you can't just pick one or two of them. All four of them are very important for a good foundation of worship. All four of them. We must do those things. You know, there, and then we have many others that goes, we have singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, we have musical instruments, uh, giving thanks, uh, sharing the gospel, hosp- 
hospitality, uh, giving one of our tithes and all friends, uh, feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, helping the needy. I mean, we there's many that go along with that, but that that foundation has to be, it has to be like that. And then and then where we started, my time is running out, but. In chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, Then when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that in those last few words right there, five words, they had been with Jesus. Let me tell you something. Are people able to see when you have been with Jesus, when you have been in his word studying, you've been in, with, you've been in prayer with the Lord, when you've been assembled together, when you've been sitting under the teaching and preaching of God's word, can people tell that you've, you have been with Jesus? When we walk out these doors, when we leave, uh, we go back to work, we go out in the world to different, maybe uh, act, you know, leisure activities and sports, um, we're around other family members. Can people tell that you've been with Jesus? See, people ought to tell that we've been with Jesus. And if we would follow, uh, this, is the, this is why they could tell they had been with Jesus is because of those four foundations of worship. Those four foundations, they could tell. Listen, the world, the world is, is very dark in the sense of ungodliness and evil and, and unlike Christ. It's very dark. When something is done in the likeness of Christ, that light shines, and people can see it. And they need to see that through us. And so every day, we need to ask ourselves, am I living, am I talking, am I doing, uh, you know, am, am, am I going where I'm going, uh, what I'm studying, or, am, or I'm doing all these things I'm doing, can people know that I've been with Jesus? And I hope and pray that, that we will come to that place in our life to make sure we walk with the Lord so that others, just by the way we talk and walk and what we say and just looking at us and seeing the light of Christ in us, they can tell we've been with Jesus because they know what the world, they listen, they know what darkness looks like. They, they've been in it. They see that. But not very many people can see the light of Christ, and not very many people, unfortunately, can say that about Christians is to look out and, and be, or be around them and say, boy, they, they've been with Jesus. And so we need, to, we need to make sure people can see us that way, that we've been with Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for this message. Thank you for your truth. I pray that, Lord, you would use it, Lord, for your glory and honor. Now, Father, you would change us and mold us and conform us to the image of Christ. I pray you'd help us this very week. And, Father, folks, will be able to tell that we have been with Jesus. Lord, bless us. Lord, bless us sick. Lord, touch their bodies and heal them. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you.